Now that Esai has given their constructive speeches, we move on to a part of the debate called Crossfire, in which the speakers can ask questions about those speeches. There's no formal format to Crossfire, but just remember to be courteous and polite, and to give everyone a turn to ask questions. Questions can have a couple of key purposes. The first is to clarify a point, the next is to make a point, and the last is to lay the foundations for a point that you're going to make later on in the debate. The prevalence of obesity in minority and low-income populations justify a response that targets those areas? It justifies a response, but that response shouldn't be a fat tax, as it would place an unfair economic burden on those population segments. One of our questions. What other factors might cause obesity aside from unhealthy foods? And how can you say that unhealthy foods are the most important cause? Well, research shows that stress and lack of exercise also contribute to obesity. Uh, but the federal government doesn't have the ability to regulate those two items in a person's life. What the federal government does have the ability to do is regulate the kinds of foods that a person consumes. And if the government wants us to have a healthy, happy citizenry, then the government should encourage the citizens to eat healthy foods. Uh, I have a question. You spoke about the cost of healthier food, but how much do the, co the health treatments of obesity cost? When you ask this question, you have to look at the long-term cost and the short-term cost. When you have these uh, low-income people who have a very limited income, they're going to be spending the money on food that is cheaper rather than looking down the road and seeing how much money they save. So rather than buying the more expensive, healthier foods, they're going to save more money, as much money as they can, by buying the cheaper, unhealthy food. Uh, and one last question. How are tobacco and alcohol adequate parallels to food if they're non-essential goods while food is an essential good? I would agree with you that food in general is an essential good because everyone needs to eat, but the types of foods that we're going to be targeting with attacks on unhealthy foods are foods like soda and candy and potato chips, things that really aren't essential. And if you tax them more, people are going to buy less of them. Throughout the debate, each debater has a certain amount of reserved prep time, or time that they can use to prepare their thoughts and their arguments in the debate round. The prep time can be used at any time between speeches or questions during the round, and it's usually around four minutes, and it's up to the speakers themselves to allocate that time. When the competitors end prep time, we move on to the second speeches, or the rebuttal speeches, in which the competitors are supposed to respond to the arguments made in crossfire and made during the constructive speeches. They're going to be made in the same order as the constructive speeches were given, so affirmative first and then negative. Let's get started. My opponent claimed that the fat tax would unfairly target low-income populations, but actually it would be a net benefit to minority and low-income communities, contrary to my opponent's position, because it would generate savings on healthcare costs, as well as a source of revenue for community health programs. The, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention found that the total healthcare costs associated with obesity in 2006 was $147 billion nationally, and obese patient, patients themselves spent $1,429 more on their medical care each year than people who weren't overweight. That's a 42% higher price tag just for being obese, even if low, lower income individuals may pay a higher price for their food under the fat tax. It would make up for it by the fact that their health care bills would be significantly lower, especially in the long run, given obesity's contribution to diseases like heart disease and diabetes. But even on a short-term scale, obesity caused $237.6 million worth of hospitalizations among children in 2005. In other words, low-income individuals aren't just feeling the impacts of health care costs due to lower obesity in the distant future, they would feel them today in less intensive care for their children. Moreover, the fat tax generates a source of revenue for federal obesity prevention programs, which might extend beyond those dealing with unhealthy foods to also target exercise and wellness initiatives. As it stands, those programs are poorly funded in low-income areas, and the use of a national blanket sales tax would be a great way to secure funds for diversity of individuals, which could then be funneled into communities that need them. In short, a fat tax is actually a net good for most deserving people. And I absolutely agree with my opponent that any solution proposed to the obesity problem cannot negatively impact those who are already struggling. I too hope to improve their livelihoods, and a fat tax does just that, which is why I urge you to affirm the resolution.
A fat tax is not the most effective way to reduce obesity, contrary to my opponent's statements, namely because it fails to accomplish the goals that she herself identified in any effective government policy. It should be targeted precisely on a root cause, and it should prevent undue government intervention. The most important factor contributing to obesity isn't unhealthy food, it's actually the lack of exercise. My opponent cited the fact that in regions where 90% of individuals report eating low levels of fruits and vegetables, obesity rates are 35% to justify for the importance of eating healthy. But the numbers are even more staggering for exercising. In communities where 40% of individuals almost never exercise, there the obesity rates are almost 50%. Clearly, unhealthy foods is only one small factor in the obesity puzzle, and the government's time and resources may be better spent targeting other elements of this problem. My partner spoke about choices in her opening speech, namely the choices that low-income individuals make to maximize their calories per dollar. Those choices are crucial for every American at every month of the income ladder to make. No one knows better than you as to where your dollars should be going to support your livelihood and your well-being. Not only does the fact tax ineffectively target the root problem of obesity, it takes away from our fundamental right to make choices about your consumption in the process. This principle is at the bedrock of our democratic and capitalist society. I firmly oppose the resolution, and I hope you do as well. Thank you. Let's take a second to debrief what we just saw. Both speakers started with constructive speeches that laid the foundations for their arguments in the round. Then we saw the speakers ask each other questions in a portion of the debate called Crossfire. And then finally we heard from the speakers again in the rebuttal speeches, in which they refuted the points that were brought up in, during the Crossfire, as well as in the constructive speeches. Thanks for listening today, guys, and I hope you have a good one.